we are live. Great. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this event titled Duplicates, Iterations, Data, and Visuality. The format of this afternoon will be a roundtable discussion surrounding the intersection of technology and art. This talk is programmed in support of the AI for Art 2022 competition taking place at Duke University. The competition is sponsored by the Center for Computational Thinking and will be accepting submissions through February 18th of this year. The results of the competition will be announced on March 3rd at the Center for Computational Thinking Symposium. There will be another event supporting the competition at this same time and the same day next week. It will include a gentle introduction to some technical methods for applying neural networks to the creation of visual output. This event may be of special interest for competition participants who have interest in machine learning and net neural networks, but little or no experience in that area. You will find that event on the same YouTube channel you're watching this on. I'd like to thank Matthew Hershey, Shelley Ruskinovich, Isabel Valls, and Tiffany Torres for their help in supporting the competition and this event today. I'm Augustus Wendell. I'm an assistant professor of the practice in the Department of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies and a core faculty member in Computational Media, Arts, and Cultures program. My work is divided between computational art involving the sensing and simulation of geographies through technology and the application of computational media to researching the historic built environment. And I'll be moderating the talk this afternoon. And now I'm pleased to introduce our three roundtable participants. Mine Chetangaya Rundel is Professor of the Practice and Director of Undergraduate Studies at the Department of Statistical Science and an affiliated faculty in the Computational Media Arts and Cultures program. Mine's work focuses on innovation in statistics and data science, pedagogy, with an emphasis on computing, reproducible research, student-centered learning, and open source education. Mine teaches data visualization both at the introductory level and has recently been integrating creating generative art pieces into her teaching, both to get a chance to practice a hobby and as a way of teaching computing through the creation of art pieces. Bill Fick is a printmaker who lives in Durham, North Carolina. He is a lecturing fellow in the Department of Art, Art History and Visual Studies, where he teaches drawing, printmaking, comics and zines. He is also the assistant director for visual and studio art at Duke's Rubenstein Art Center. His work has been exhibited from New York City to Seoul, South Korea, and can be found in the collections of the Fogg Art Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the New York Public Library, and the Zimmerli Art Museum in Rutgers University. Fick is also co-author with Beth Grabowski of Printmaking, a complete guide to materials and processes published by Lawrence King Publishing London. And finally, Kelsey Broad, is a PhD student in the Computational Media Arts and Cultures program, a program that emphasizes theory through practice. Broad is currently working on an aesthetic framework of machine performance, exploring the ways in which computation creates and contours both art and ideas of what art can be. Broad was recently an artist in residence at the Power Plant Gallery last summer, and they are currently working on two shows, one at the Rubenstein with fellow CMAC students, and an online exhibition through Duke's Visualizing Care series, both opening in mid-February. They are also teaching an advanced printmaking course with Bill Fick, exploring the relationship between coding and screen printing. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm wondering, thinking about this talk in terms of the competition and in terms of um, competition participants who, who are tuning in, I'm wondering if it would make sense to unpack a little bit where computation meets art for each of us and kind of talk that out and see if we can unpack where maybe technology and computation fit and whether they're intertwined or, or if they're distinct. And I'm wondering if someone wants to um, pick up that question and, and, and work with it. Maybe I'll go. Kelsey. Oh, Bill, <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, um, I mean, almost all my work is is uh, analog, but for me, in terms of computing, um, Photoshop, Illustrator, things like that, um, 
or what I use. So for me, it's a very rudimentary use of the computer and co computation. Um, however, that's the whole point of this course that I'm teaching with, co-teaching with Kelsey, is to see if we can introduce some uh, other elements into the creative process in this screen print, in making screen prints. So, um, so for me, but for me as a as an artist, it's really just as a as another tool uh, for me to create images. But it's you know in, in things like Photoshop, uh, Illustrator, those are the two that I would use the most. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering if I can just follow up on that, Bill, as a, as a screen printer, I think sometimes when we hear the term technology or computation, we, we think exclusively of, let's say, traditional computers and these applications, but do you see it as a continuum? And I'm wondering where the division is technology wise between what's happening after the computer, what's happening before the computer and wonder if you have some thoughts on on it as a as a spectrum and as a continuum yeah I mean I think you know well what's interesting is screen printing is initial was always well not always but early on was considered a very commercial technical process um, artists didn't really embrace it till much later um, I mean I think it was invented sort of in the early part of the 20th century um, so it was considered a technical pro you know it was technology it was this new technology uh, and um, so um, it really didn't become a big an important part of the sort of fine art printmaking until later. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, you have photography, screen printing, and there's those two overlap a lot, you know, uh, and I think now it's just this natural progression that um, you would be using uh, printing, printmaking as a, as a, um, a way of intersecting with technology and image making. Um, I think a lot of folks probably associate digital printers with printing nowadays, you know, like, okay. But I think what's interesting about this competition is figuring out ways to, uh, you know, generate tangible objects um, or things that can be viewed um, not just as printouts, but how can you, how can you make artwork, um, you, know, uh, tangi you know, tangible artwork from your, your, your computation uh, computerized images and things like that. So I think that's the big, the big sticking point is like, how do you, I mean, it, you know, I've seen some amazing stuff that's in the computer. And I'm pointing at my computer. <laughs> uh, I, you know, um, but what I, what I feel is lacking is sort of the output. And I think, I know we pre, you know, we talked a little bit about this before we, you know, before today about how uh, maybe with this competition, and, and Augustus, you might want to clarify that as we go through that, uh, you know, that these pieces might be, um, you know, conceptually, um, maybe we will see them in one form, but they might have a, a much deeper and bigger uh, backstory or back end on, on, the, on the work. So, um, so yeah, anyhow, I don't know if that's making any sense, but <laughs> that's kind of oh, just yes. opening up the can of worms there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Let me just hop on to your, your great prompt of kind of teasing out a little bit how what the format of the material is and, and, and some of our, our discussions as a, as a group that the rest of those aren't privy to who are on the call. Um, so there is a very specific format that we're requiring, which is a digital image. And I think um, it's incredibly important as you're, as you're bringing up to for, for participants to think not only of their work as a physical image, but, or as a digital image, but is that, how is that tied to process? And is that image something that simply comes out of a technological process or that image might be a photograph of something that is physical, that had te this technology and some generative AI system incorporated in it. And that maybe there's, there's, a, there's much more opportunity to push and be kind of free and liberal within um, what is delivered then might be immediately apparent with that, um, with the way it's phrased in the call being a digital file in particular. Yeah, I think um, if, if I could share an image um, or share my screen really quickly. Oh, sorry, wait a minute. Let me, yeah. Um, is that being shared? Do we? Are people seeing that it says diagram and certificate? Steven says yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Um, I think I lost Steven there. 
But anyway, <laughs> an interesting artist that, um, uh, is, this is Saul Lewitt, and he was an artist that would make instructions um, for artwork. So, um, so here's a case where he, these wall drawings where he had instructions that was that, you know, so he didn't actually make the work, but he had instructions on how, what to make. So this is, you know, as conceptually, this is very interesting work in that, um, you know, there, there is this instruction, but the end product is made by somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. And he's just, so, you know, I can see how this could really intersect a lot with um, some computational work where maybe the artist has instructions and they feed it to the computer and the computer generates uh, the work. Um, so I don't know if that, um, and I can show an example Another example, um, this is the Lewitt, a Lewitt wall drawing. And it, so he had given a museum and the people that they had purchased his instructions and the piece was uh, generated from the instructions. But he didn't make he didn't make it. He somebody else made it. So so maybe the, the idea here could be where the artist is generate is cr creating instructions and then the computer executes the instructions. Right. Uh, so something like that. So that's Ooh. great. I had actually pulled out um, Yoko Ono's grapefruit, which I'm showing on my webcam. Um, and um, she was also a part of the Fluxus movement. And grapefruit is an instructional book well, uh, where readers can go through different um, prompts that she gives you. So the one that I had pulled out is called, called painting, painting to be constructed in your head. Observe, Observe three paintings, paintings carefully, carefully. Mix, mix them well in your head. <laughs> so they're instructions for um, imagination, I guess. Um, and in thinking about Augustus's original question, like the difference between computation and art, I think that's hard because for me, it's difficult to distinguish them um, because for me, like computation is a way of seeing or imagining the world um, and through which there are different styles or different aesthetics. So Kelsey, just to follow up on that, computation is a way of seeing the world. I mean, there's the very literal where we're surrounded by tools of, of computing that we're used that's mediating the way that we see the world. Um, but I suppose also in, in maybe the creative practice, it's a, it's a lens through which we can, or maybe just another lens among uh, many lenses that we might have, or many tools we might have as creative practitioners to be able to show the way that we're seeing the world. And all of those tools kind of sit alongside more traditional processes as, as ways of kind of sharing our vision of the world. Right, right. Um... And I wonder about, Kelsey, do you have some thoughts on this, the, the LeWitt drawing um, algorithm and how, I mean, it's very literally an algorithm, right? This is an mm -hmm. algorithm for humans to draw and it right. is not a, a far reach to get from that to algorithms, let's say that you might be teaching in this class with, with Bill where you're, talk, where you're teaching P5 algorithmic generation. I mean, the, the leap is incredibly short when we see something as clearly outlined as a set of rules as, as Lewitt's wall drawings, right? Yeah, uh, so, sorry, what is the question that they're well, similar in the, their method? Well, they're, they're similar, I'm thinking for, for seeing how the instructions for a wall drawing can yield a piece of art that it's not a great leap for those of us working in computation to see that that's very similar, exactly the same as the way that we're making algor algorithms that generate uh, digital art. And maybe maybe the question here, if I can kind of play this out a little bit more is, um, in the case of Saul Lewitt, it what's the implication of someone else making that drawing? Or maybe that there could be many of those drawings. I mean, part of this talk is about duplicates or was titled as duplicates. So there can be infinitesimal outputs from these algorithms or from these wall drawings. And I wonder if you, or if any of our, of our panel have some thoughts on the preciousness maybe. I think traditionally in art, we often put on a pedestal the outcomes and that it's made by the artist and that it's one of a kind and then that bestows a certain 
um, kind of preciousness to it. But in the case of these wall drawings, it's it's entirely different from that, right? It's it's about anyone being able to make them as long as they're following a certain set of prescribed rules, and each drawing is going to be to be different. Yeah, I think the. I mean, I think the the, the you know with Lewitt's work. I mean, they're very large, you know, so he, he gives the instructions, but the output is, you know, they're very large on walls. Uh, they're using uh, pencils or paint or things like that. And I think in the case of this competition, um, I think it'd be great for folks to be thinking that way um, because a lot of what we see is something that gets printed out on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Um, and it just really doesn't have any kind of visual power. It's just, it might be amazing in the computer, but then when we see it on a little piece of paper, it looks like nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think the, the important thing here is to, for the folks who are going to make work for this competition is to think about the output. Um, you know, if you come up with this really complex and beautiful uh, algorithm to create an image, think about how it's going to be seen um, and don't, you know, give it the respect it deserves. Don't, don't, don't give it, don't print it out on a little piece of paper and then say, this is my piece. It's, you've got to really think what are the possibilities of this? Uh, and I don't know, uh, Augustus, how you, that might translate in terms of the presentation, but I think we had talked about that maybe if there's some explanation about like how the piece would be viewed, uh, that would have some, you know, that might have some strength in terms of how the the piece is judged uh, if i'm if i'm thinking if that's correct i don't know absolutely i th i think i think whenever there's a consideration to how the piece should be understood how it should be viewed that that should be part of the submission process and that there'll, there'll be room for that um and to your point about kind of manifesting these in in a larger more significant form or being open to that and being aware that the scale and the size and the placement within the world is is so important to to works of art that there are many resources on campus apart from what is distinctly made available through this competition that would be useful things like the collab and other printing resources that could very successfully strategically intersect with some of this and that students ought to um, or participants ought to be kind of thinking about that and taking advantage of those resources for sure mm -hmm. yeah definitely Mina, I wonder, um, before we move on to another question, I wonder what, what your take is on where, especially coming from a, a data visualization background and yet making artworks and teaching through the making of creative works, where you see, perhaps from a, from a data standpoint, that the connection or the juncture between computation and art and, and kind of some of your observations or maybe how you approach it in, in your own work. Yeah, so I think um, one difference that you know, I kind of figured that was the case, but also listening to the others, um, it's very obvious to me is this idea of, uh, you know, writing an algorithm to do something. And to me, that's um, uh, like a very second nature thing. And I think to our students who might be participating in the competition, who are coming from a background of like statistics or computer science, not necessarily with an emphasis in art to begin with. It's probably, um, yes, we can see each other. It's probably um, going to be, um, you know, for them, this idea of writing an algorithm for the computer to do something is probably very second nature. That thing being an art piece, not so much. And I think that's where the stretch for, you know, coming at it not from an art background will be. So, um, you know, when we're doing data visualizations, it feels like, Sure, you should be creative, maybe a little bit, but there's more like there's a truth you're trying to reflect. And it's almost like you should hold back on creativity to bring out the truth. And I feel like when you're making maybe a computational artwork, it's kind of the opposite. We're not trying to reveal some relationship that can be kind of gleaned with a particular visualization tool. And it's almost like there's a right tool and a wrong tool to communicate that message. And it's more like, maybe take the data or the any sort of message you may be wanting to send about like where how the data values that you might be plotting um, out of context and think about it as a piece of art. And that will probably 
not come easily to people who haven't tried this before. It certainly doesn't come super easily to me. But once you break that, I feel like it's so freeing because you're no longer constrained by, is this the sort of plot I should make for this sort of variable? Like, uh, you know, in creating images that are data visualizations, especially as we're like people who are first getting started with it, that's such a big concern that it's almost like you worry about making mistakes or the right or the wrong approaches and not being um, kind of constrained by that is really freeing. Um, so, but I think that sort of freeing thing can also be difficult because now it's like you have to think, well, okay, how do I get creative with, I don't know, things that are on my computer um, in, in a way to like create maybe like a visually appealing image that may not be something that people have tried before. But what I can say, and this is something like we try to do um, in my classes where we try to bring up these ideas is maybe do start with a data visualization and then just like strip away the data that you were trying to uh, visualize in terms of the meaning and then start looking at it as like pixels on the screen and then go from there. And maybe like the resulting art piece has nothing to do with the data whatsoever. But sometimes it's so hard to stare at a blank canvas, you know, and then maybe even paint on it can be hard, but write code to get pixels onto the screen can be hard. So starting with some image and then modifying it might be an approachable way to get started. Mm. You know, what, what you were just saying about the, this tension of trying to pull back, um, I'm sharing something on my screen now, which is uh, from a project of two data visualizers who sent these, um, sent these postcards back and forth to each other. And they were these very personal recordings of certain activities that were taken. And I believe what we're looking at here is technically it's a, it's a, it's a data log of saying goodbyes and saying good nights and sort of exclamations. And it's using some of the language of symbology and color and coding, but it's obfuscating in, in other ways, what, what is being communicated here. Right. So it's, it seems to play in a fairly simple way into this tension of, well, is it trying to explain itself and be correct or is it taking data as part of a kind of raw starting point and then becoming a little more playful and becoming um, a little bit more it's okay to not explain and it's okay to use this as a raw raw starting point and once those rules are followed it becomes this thing along the way this the process of codifying it turns it into a visual artifact and we could maybe discuss whether we think this is art or still data visualization, but I think it's a nice illustration of how someone coming from a data back background might be able to kind of use that as a starting point to push forward and, and do some exploratory studies. Yeah, it, I don't have an image for this, but something this brings to mind is, um, I don't know if you've seen those scarves people knit that are actually like, are um, it's like temperature every day. So it's supposed to show like global warming or something like that. So it really is a data visualization, but you've taken it from this like heat map that might be a very traditional way of visualizing that data. And then you've turned it into a knit scarf and that's like a different piece. And again, is that art or is that data visualization? Maybe I'm not so sure, but ultimately it is really just like pushing it from the first idea that comes to mind of putting the, that data into a visual format for someone who's coming from a data visualization background to like another medium or stripping the data away. I think all of these like, like kind of incremental pushes to something different than what the software default might be giving you to visualize the data are good ways to make progress towards kind of something a little bit more creative. Absolutely. I wonder if um, Kelsey or, or Bill, if you have any thoughts on the notion of experimentation maybe coming from, from your work, because it sounds like that's, that's, that, that was also present. I saw in, in Mine's kind of uh, discussion here of, of how to, how to liberate yourself and how to with some intentionality and to be able to deviate and, and to explore deviations and maybe to explore multiples and this idea that there isn't a right or wrong. So I don't know if either of you have something kind of in your own process that would be kind of interesting to share as a way that you instigate kind of exploring and, and form finding and, and the pathways to, to reach wherever you end up with your work at the end. Um, yeah, the infinity fall work 
um, which I'll put on my screen, um, definitely came from experimentation. I was taking a Unity course here, and um, let me see if I can move that over a little bit. Um, <laughs> I was taking a Unity course here, uh, didn't know the software that well, and I just had a sphere in Unity, uh, and I was like, hey, what'll happen if I just let it go forever in, in Unity, and I put gravity on it, and I just let it fall? Um, and I was like, okay, great. This could be an interesting work about like, you know, the infinite computation of, of this software. I returned to my desk maybe like three hours later and realized I couldn't see the sphere. Um, and that's how I learned that Unity was using, so using something called floating point arithmetic, which um, gets more imprecise um, as, you, as it calculates the location of an object from an origin point. Um, and in normal gaming, what they'll usually do is reset the origin point to be closer to an object as it moves away from the original origin point. Um, but in this work, I just let uh, what eventually turned to be a, a little narrative about a laptop um, fall and um, sort of dissolve and express uh, what uh, was being used to locate it, which was floating point arithmetic. Um, and I've been doing different Unity experiments since then, like colliding objects in different ways and um, think, trying to challenge my normative understanding of physics and under, realizing that Unity can't exactly reproduce it. So it'll, um, you know, produce interesting results. I think the lesson to take from that for me is that, yeah, it was this this lovely discovery that happened purely in many ways, purely by by accident, right? It's something that you couldn't you couldn't plan how to get there. It was only through being open to process and being open to experimentation that that you arrived at that. Right, so and sometimes walking away. <laughs> yeah, you know, quite time. literally. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I think um, that I this can, idea. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say in terms of like my work, I you know, so again I'm it's all analog. Um I think if we can sh I'm sharing my screen here. Um so Andy, this is a very famous Andy Warhol. Is that it can we see it? Yeah. Are yeah. we seeing? It? Yeah, okay. So this is um so Andy Warhol did this famous cow wallpaper. Um and so but you know it started out as just one of those images, but then by repeating it um you know creates this design um also just the idea that it's a cow uh, there's humor there uh the colors um so i mean even just something as simple as just repeating it and creating a grid offsetting it things like that um are just some very simple strategies to to create uh you know it, it, this could easily be applied to some sort of an algorithm um so instead of maybe just having one image perhaps the idea of replication uh, with printmaking, I mean, it's easy because that's what you do. You you print over and over and over again. You make multiples. Um, but this could, you know, could, it seems like it could be easily applied to any computational algorithm in, and uh, process. Maybe there would be some ways of changing colors. Uh, maybe that would be something which feed in different variations or glitches that might cause some interesting things happening. Um, but, yeah, that's just a great example. Again, but look at the scale, though. I think. I keep keep coming back to that that the scale uh, is 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 helps the piece really have some substance. So absolutely, and and not to beat a dead horse about the um, about the algorithm, but and and rules. But I think again, it is it is so easy to see that translation when you talk about how printmakers are. That's what you do is you're iterating prints. It makes us, it makes me think that that's also what so many of us are doing who are more digitally native, that we're constantly reprinting and replotting as well in our own more ephemeral way. And that by mm -hmm. kind of combining these in a sensitive way that we're not maybe, are we getting rid of the last print or plot or are we kind of collecting plots? How, how can we reflect on that process? And the changes that we make to those rules along the way and, and how it can yield a, um, an output. It, it feels just as relevant to, to digitally native as to, as to analog. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, 
I mean, I think it's very similar in that, you know, when I make an image, it has to go through this process and then it's output. So I think it's pretty much the same thing as with any kind of digital process is that you feed something in, it goes through a process and then it's output. So, um, so it's, it's, it's very similar. I mean, it's really, really similar. So it's funny because for me, like people say, well, well, you know, do you a lot of do you do a lot of drawings? Uh, I do do a lot of drawings, but I never show my drawings because I I really feel like I have to go through this process, this printed process. It's this weird thing. I just don't feel like my work is complete unless it's gone through some process. So I think for the people that are thinking about this competition, think of it that way: that you're feeding your information into something, your computational work or whatever, and then you output something. I keep going back to the output because that's where I find that a lot of digital work falls short is that it it's not it, it's beautiful on the screen and, and you're like, wow, beautiful. I love it. But and it can live that way on a monitor or, a, you know, maybe the monitor could be really huge or something. But think about how as a physical object it might live in, in the world. And that could be lots of different ways. So. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who are used to thinking because our output is digital, it can it can only stay on the screen, really embracing this idea that that's just part of the process and it, it moves on from there and that we can mm -hmm. we can extend our scope beyond what we maybe do in our normal day to day practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Mina, I wanted to come back to you. I, I, I wasn't sure if, if I if we'd cut you off, if you had a comment about Kelsey's piece before we had moved on. Yeah, I wanted to share this uh, one thing that's open on my screen. There's um there's this Twitter account called Accidental Art. I think folks who are our users might be familiar with it, but it just came from Kelsey mentioning, you know, I just let my computer, you know, do its thing for a while and then came back to it. These are all well, mostly data visualizations actually that were not intended to look yeah. this way. So they're generally coding errors in a way. Cool. But yeah. um it just so happens that, you know, you can start, take any one of these, if you think mm -hmm. about it, as the start of an art piece. And then, as Bill was mentioning, like, iterate through by changing some things. And, you know, you could basically kind of accidentally stumble into art, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. I think they're a great example of how they weren't, the intention wasn't to make them. But as soon as you see the software make one of these things, you start realizing, oh, actually, I don't, you know, I can I can use the same tools I know to use just in a different way to create images um, that, you know, maybe have a striking look, even if they tell me nothing about the original data I was trying to visualize. Yeah. That's great. I, I love that. I love that. That's that's perfect. Yeah. I think what what's exciting to me about that is that there there can be an intentionality right you're you're hijacking or co-opting the tools once you see that and you lean into that and then that opens up a world of possibilities of yes i'm still starting with data but you know, what what more can be done or, or how can i maybe yeah. undo or invert or or take take intention into making this as a as a body of as a body of creative output yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I'm thinking too, like this was originally framed as something that's accidental, but I think really it's more like a collaboration because I think we all experience, you know, something happens and we didn't quite expect it, but we find it exciting. And so we, we try and push it, right? And so, and it's, uh, it's more of like, you're listening to this output uh, because it doesn't work exactly how your mind works and you can respond to it. Yeah, if I could jump in, if you can see, I'm sharing my screen here. Um, can you all see it? Freedom without love? Not yet. No, that's you, my screen. Is it up yet? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. This is Mark Bradford, who's a really hot, really great young artist, or well, not super young, but. Anyway, what's interesting about this is that he creates lots of, he pastes layers and layers of paper and stuff, glue, and then he starts to remove it with a, a sanding, a sander. He sands down the layers, and then what happens, it starts to reveal different layers. So it's purely by chance. He has no, he has a basic idea what's going to happen, but as he sands the, sands the surface down, it reveals things. So it's very much like what we just saw about where there was these errors. 
uh, and just randomness. Um, but you know, the end product is very, just this beautiful, but it's really about this deterioration and, um, like he actually, the freedom without love was like a poster and then he outlined it with glue and then he started pasting stuff on top of it and then he started sanding it down. So there's this really wonderful, just re revealing and layering that's going on, which I think is something that could easily, be, I think could easily translate into some computational work. Absolutely. It seems to require an embrace of uncertainty, right, Bill, is is being okay not knowing what you're going to be getting right. out of it. And right. it, it right. kind of right. comes back to Kelsey's point of the, the, the technology, whatever it is, whether it's a sander on paper or a plot function in R or, or Unity becomes this partner and you're in a dance of figuring out kind of how together you're going to make something that couldn't be made otherwise and discover really discover maybe is a better word discover something along the way that couldn't have been you couldn't have conceived of per se when you were starting that out yeah well i think like maybe my interest in thinking of it as a collaboration is like sort of acknowledging the agency and the material um and the you know whether that's the material itself if you're say, a new materialist or if you're just acknowledging the people who have built and engineered that thing under a certain logic and so it's responding in the way that they expected that they designed it it for which may not be the reason that you're using the technology for your own purposes but it's responding to someone else's expectations in the past so you're kind of collaborating with the you know, someone else who designed this thing before you. It's a really beautiful thought to think about, for me to think about that that agency, not only of that technology, but of, of reaching back to the origin of it and to the intention that was created when, when the tool was, was built. Let's see. Maybe we can take a moment and, and pivot here and think about this the name of this competition that that we're kind of talking in service to is is AI for art, and I think you know Kelsey, you've kind of started to chisel away at some of how we can begin to think about AI and think about the agency and what what it means to um, to be working in in tandem with an artificial intelligence. But I thought maybe we could each tease out a little bit of what. How, how we understand that term, because I think there are, there are a number of preconceptions maybe from our students of what, what is AI and what isn't, and that there may be kind of a narrow, a more narrow band initially for some participants than, than that term actually encompasses. And I wonder, maybe Mina, do, do you, where do you see the bounds if you're approaching this and you're, you're thinking AI? For art, like where 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 does it start and end, or how do you begin to quantify this? What what are the technologies that are on the table, or the methods on the table? Yeah, I have. Well, maybe I will take the liberty to start with a snarky answer. It's like if every other startup can do something and call it AI, I think if you feel like what you're doing is AI, you can call it that too. So I would very much encourage people who are like, hey. I heard about this competition. It sounds interesting to not get bogged down by is what I'm doing AI. Um, and, you know, think about it kind of more broadly. And that's not to say anything flies, but maybe anything does fly ultimately. Um, and, 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 and as far as I understand, we don't have as part of the kind of entry into the competition, a justification for why what you thought is AI. So I don't think they necessarily need to articulate it in that way. So you don't even have to defend it. Um, that, that doesn't necessarily help someone get started, but maybe it helps someone get unstuck and not be bogged down by, am I defining this correctly? But to be now less snarky and like be helpful to someone maybe get started, um, I would suggest, um, you know, and again, I'll come at this from the perspective of someone who's maybe day job isn't to create art as in like maybe you're coming at this with I like creating visual things um, and I know that I can do certain visual things with uh, kind of computing and coding but is what I'm creating art like how do I push this to be something that might be called art to maybe start small and do this like try to draw just anything I don't know when I was trying to 
think about how do I teach generative art to my students, especially given I don't know much about it. Like, how do I teach that? How do I open that conversation when I don't necessarily feel like I'm an expert in this was I was like, okay, well, let's draw a flower. You know, first of all, let's think about how do we make the computer draw a flower but we're not going to like give you a single flower to draw, right? It's not like one of those like painting lessons where you're trying to replicate the exact thing. It's like you think about what a flower might look like and then let's try to get that on there. But then let's try to parametrize some of the things we've done and then start tweaking with um, those parameters. Say if there's like a random number generation, try different random numbers to start with. And then at some point, if you start seeing a pattern, is there a way you can capture that as a function and start building out a system? And like Bill was mentioning earlier, I think this idea of creating duplicates so that you can see the same image with different parameters and just create many, many of them um, is a great way to kind of keep pushing yourself until you start seeing something where it's like, okay, that one I like. And you don't even have to articulate why you like it, maybe. Um, But if you can articulate why you like it, like I like this X feature of this image I drew, as soon as you can articulate it, it becomes feasible to then write code to create that particular feature and keep tweaking it maybe intentionally. Um, But I think something I like is that um, there's no requirement to make sure every aspect of the art piece you're creating is tweakable intentionally. Some of it might just so happen that, I don't know, when I created this generative system, this particular random seed gave me a picture I like better than the other one. And that's why I'm going to go with that. You know, the first one is also like an equally valid way of choosing one of those duplicates that you create as it is like, I have intentionally selected this one because it conveys a particular message I'm trying to convey. So maybe thinking about it as uh, like little bits of code that you can write to generate pieces of an image that then you can kind of wrap together into functions is a way to get started. There's so much, so much in that, Mina. <laughs> I'm going to let, if Kelsey or Bill want to hop in before me, but I've, I've got a lot of response to what you were just saying, I think. All right, I'm going to hop in. I, what, what struck me, well, there were two, two things. One was you well articulated this, this idea of editing, right? That, that if, if we're not, if we're experimenting, the importance of the duplicates is that we can then edit we can meaning we can select right we can choose from and that we don't make one but through many we then can deliberate and judge and decide what we want to put forward and that that's not always something easy to explain how how we feel that way how we arrive at that decision but if we don't have many to choose from or duplicates and iterations, then then we, we can't weigh in on that. And that's where many of our kind of inherent visual understanding, visual cues, ways that we we judge better or worse, right or wrong, and the aesthetics of, of the visual world around us come come to bear. So that that to me resonated so so clearly in what you were saying. And the other maybe more intoxicating notion is the the flower as you described it you're talking about like the meta flower, right? So, so we try to make a flower. We try to define somehow those features. And what you end up with is the every flower, the the no flower, the the system that lets you make as many permutations of flower. And, and in that, I think the affordances of using technology that can iterate quickly, that can, can you can feed it this and it can can make you many and it can, can toy with it and change those parameters is, is, is so powerful and that we don't know we don't know what flowers we might discover to keep it in the language of, of the flowers and the generative. Hmm. Yeah, I think duplicates is a really interesting um, almost tension with computation because in some ways, like a lot of code is optimized so that things don't have to be duplicated. Or if you think of, about the way that software is always updated, we rarely ever get to like work in Adobe 2022 and Adobe 2000 and see what different kind of like outputs they would have, um, if that makes sense. Like we, there's like not a lot of version history because code is just replaced. And so it's interesting. Yeah, that's a great like challenge to keep old cult, 
code and not just like write over it um, and document how things progress. Hmm. I wonder if if one were to be having have made a generative system, does it always come down to any one output? Like, is there could it, could there be artwork defined as the very method that you've you've made? Is that are we are we pushing into kind of dangerous territory here, or yeah. it kind of gets me back to Saul Lewitt's like rules that yeah. that the artwork was a printed sheet of paper with some words on it, and it the magic is what that one that what that unleashes. Um, sorry, Bill, I think you maybe had a response. No, I I mean no, you're right. It's it is dangerous territory because you know. It's, um, but I think, but but it's you know maybe good dangerous territory. I think it's, uh, I mean, because like Lewitt's work was very controversial when it came when he was working on it. People were like, "Are you kidding me? This is this can't be art." Uh, but I mean, again, it was, um, and his early work was very conceptual. It was you know um, a lot of it was just on paper, you know, ideas, things like that. But. Uh, later on, his work got very, very colorful and you know really lively, and uh, and the the engagement too. I think it's another thing that maybe some folks might not understand is that a lot of it is participatory and community engagement. So I don't know if some of the students who are interested in this competition, you know, can, you could think of it also as maybe that there would be a participatory component to it, or at least you would need to explain that that there would be some. Particip uh, participation by the audience or something like that. Uh, maybe we're getting into some pretty deep territory there, but but that idea that it's it's again maybe just not one one output or or something like that, but that it's that it's um that it could involve other ways of maybe bringing the audience together or, or separating the audience or I don't know. So um, that could be an abstract thought for some folks who aren't familiar with. Art history but but uh but anyway um try to think of some some things that are relative to that um i mean games games i was thinking about games you know like video games and other kinds of like i was looking i was looking at an old diagram of monopoly and it was the it was the patent for monopoly and it's these beautiful drawings of how the game is played and i'm wondering also if there's some if game game creating great game creation or some sort of simple game could qualify as a piece of art for this program, for this, you know, uh, you know, if there was something, um, which is sort of related to the solo with thing in terms of there's instructions and you follow them, but. Yeah, you know. well, the falling work that I shared is made in a gaming software, um, but yeah. sometimes I hesitate calling it a game. I'll call it an open world. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, what I create in Unity, the gaming software can work as a still, I think, um, you know, because you're experimenting with light, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. Augustus, I had brought examples um, and some resources yeah. for students to, yeah. to think about. I don't know if... Um, I wanted Please. to show like two AI works and then um, yeah. simpler effective works too. Um, this work by Terrence Broad is called Blade Runner, Blade Runner Auto Encoded, and um, Auto Encoded is a um, a neural network that he built himself and then implemented on TensorFlow. Uh, which is an open source platform um, that the students could use for machine learning and AI. And there are free tutorials on TensorFlow. Um, and in this project, the neural network is built to memorize films and then uh, reproduce the film as they perceive it as a memory. So in this work, he gave um, auto encoder the film Blade Runner and then asked it to play it back. Mm. And so you can see the film side by side. Um, with the original um and then you're kind of trying to piece out the difference between the memory and the real blade runner um this other work by zach blass 
um, who's a lit PhD graduate from Duke. And Jemima Wyman, I'm here to learn. So um, took this chatbot AI called Tay that Microsoft released on Twitter in 2016. Um, and when they released it, there are a bunch of trolls that quickly taught it hate speech. And then Microsoft took it down in a day. And um, Glass and Wyman resurrected Tay um, to create this sort of um, imagination of who she was or who she is. And um, they immersed her in Google Deep Dream imagery. Uh, and I like this work a lot because it's kind of, it's that balance between like taking the raw output of um, the AI and the artist's own imagination and how they're, how they're thinking of um, Tay as a person. And she starts to like theorize about her existence and her post AI death. Um, mm. Um, Daniel Tempkin um, had a series called Dither Studies where he, this is along the lines of experiments or accidents, um, used a dithering algorithm on a solid color and realized that that would express the algorithm itself. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm trying to like not make a complicated explanation, but if you're familiar with printmaking and the, the way that um, images become compressed, it uses this um, uh, image compression uses an algorithm that'll um, um, decide whether a color is one color or not, or um, change it so it reduces the color information. And so with this, um, he's just ex with one color, it shows how the algorithm is moving across um, the pixels. And dithering, oh, can we just yeah. go back? Go for it. And di dithering is, the origin of it is in like efficiency, right? In, in the inability to capture complete color spectrums and, the, and to try to kind of recreate, to create the illusion of more depth of color than could actually be encoded originally. And it, it's exciting to think of you know, the, the original intent, intention being co-opted. So this is a tool that was built to do one thing. And I mean, it, this we keep coming back to this, right? But the opportunity here is in making it do something else or taking that and, and foregrounding this this component that, that would often have been maybe seen as a, a flaw. You wouldn't want to look at dithering up close in this way. It would, it would not be celebrated because it would expose the problems. But what it exposes is the variation and the, the kind of the nuance of the algorithm and, and kind of celebrates that and foregrounds that. It's really exciting. Yeah, totally. And um, you can start to think about how you might encode information in the algorithm itself. Um, and uh, I believe actually in our uh, screen printing class, um, Bill, who's your friend? Who's the biology professor? Who? who oh yeah, you? Bob Goldstein. Yeah, he's... Yeah. Yeah, he's created some his own uh, ways of creating tone and value by dithering and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and then the last work that I had to share uh, is by Lauren Lee McCarthy, um, who created an augmented reality app uh, to be used around Dusseldorf and um, users can use the app to connect with strangers. Um, a lot of the prompts are for more introverted people. So and I think this one says the seat is reserved for someone who enjoys quiet. And so then two people mm. can connect over that way and just share some quiet time together. Um, but I really like in her work how she emphasizes like the social relationships facilitated by technology. And then the way that she documents her work is generally um, outside of the technology itself and people using the work. So is this, if I understand this app, is it marking that bench ostensibly to bring together people who will be present next to each other, but be quiet and that it's kind of, it's labeling what otherwise is public space in the, and coding it in a certain way for, for certain social behaviors? I'm not sure if um, you have to obey by the thing that unites the two of you. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that that co-opting of the the built environment and this 
otherwise publicly to mark space is, is, a, is a very rich area. It makes it quite exciting, right, to think of kind of programming in a, in a different way, spaces that are, are often unprogrammed about who, who, right. who should or will belong there. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just go through a couple of those works so that I could get some context to a couple of resources, um, yeah. such as Lauren Lee McCarthy also created P5JS, which is a visual coding platform. Um, and then also TensorFlow, this open source software that students could use. Um, and these are some sort of indexes and anthologies of different media art that students could look at. Hmm. Maybe I can get these from you and, and send them out to the folks that have um, already registered for it. And, and oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, laying out of it. Absolutely. Well, maybe I can I can share something that um, that uh, comes back to some of our earlier thoughts about kind of data and training and memory and and um, this image it's it's by Mario Klingemann um, called the Butcher's Son and it's it's an AI generated image from a, a system most likely TensorFlow or something uh, comparable um, and it's generating an image based on its understanding and gathering specifics from other images. And so it's it's very similar, Kelsey, to what you were showing from, um, from Blade Runner, except not so explicitly keyed to a certain film. And it, it also reminds me of, um, Mini, what you were getting at with a or what I took from your description of the flower and thinking of trying to define something that has infinite variation and figuring out how to quantify it and how to, how to turn it into some procedural generative parametric system. And so what's happening here is that this system has been fed, and I believe it's most likely a, a GAN system where um, it's been fed something called training data, which is in this case, images, a, a large number of images, and it, learns right about those images it takes them in it um, it tries to understand how they work and to extract ways of representing um, that content and then on the other side it is trying to trick another component into believing that whatever it's making is real enough according to this training data and so it's it's this trying to define and trying to make something that passes enough, that passes closely enough to, to the input material. And, you know, what's happening here is some of the weights are being adjusted. Some of the um, eccentricities are being kind of taken advantage of to allow it to be more discoverable or to celebrate the fact that this, this is not like anything particular that the training data was fed. It's not an exact replica. And I think often in, in this sort of work, we maybe have seen fake celebrity faces or fake cats, like the website, this person is not real, or this cat is not real. That's the type of technology. But in this case, it's being appropriated and kind of toyed with as a, as a more kind of physical substrate, if you will, of being able to make changes and take advantage of it. And, and I wonder if there are some reactions to this this kind of common notion now of training data and what you feed a system and and how that relates to the output and, and maybe maybe about authorship like what where are the opportunities or the problems in I fed 10,000 images of something and I make a system that can make an image and and you know where where are the edges of the partnership in that between me and the technology me as the artist and the technology So maybe I'll say one thing about this, where like you mentioned this as like probably coming from again or something, which is probably the case where it's almost like that iteration that we were talking about um, that where the artist maybe manually like iterates through things, which obviously you can then, um, you know, code up another algorithm or something that will automate that process. But in that case, we can think about, I think this like iterative arriving at a piece of art that you may be happy with through like intentional things where you make a decision as the artist at each step 
versus feeding it to a system like this and genuinely just walking away from it for a while and then see what it creates for you. And maybe you do that again many times and you as the artist like choose a version of, you know, maybe one of the images that you showed. Um, and it can be that way. I think maybe some of that brings us to this, like you need to have a pretty good handle on the technology to maybe be able to both iterate and automate in like on um, all of these axes and to create many things to choose from. And sometimes the learning of the technology can be what's potentially limiting the creativity because, you know, you can't just like tell your computer, hey, you know, draw me a picture. Like you have to write the code for it. And so I would, I think it's the t technology is both like a door opening thing and potentially something that's very limiting because you may not feel comfortable exploring that technology or feel like you have the time to learn the technology. So I would say like push yourself as much as you can, but it, it, this is not a challenge in making the technology do what you originally envisioned. That may be one way of creating the art, but it might also be a challenge in saying, I'm just going to see how far we can get and see if I'm happy yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to your point, Mina, or to one of them, um, in the session coming next week, there's going to be a little, a light introduction to some systems that are mostly trained that can be co-opted, but that's not to, it's not to kind of negate that kind of clear point about the, the, the weight and burden of technology. Um, Something that, that strikes me between what you said and this piece is that there may be a power, if there's a, a code base that's existing that, you know, which there are quite a few of out there, more as a demonstration of what has been achieved and to kind of to showcase where the state of the art might be, that in the intentional co-opting and, and thinking about what you feed into it, there's, there's a great opportunity for creativity. Like if it's made to feed in a whole lot of images of the same thing to get you something that's matching that, you know, what happens if you feed it only a few, few images in, or what happens if you feed it images that are kind of separated into to different kind of groups and, and think about how to disrupt it, disrupt that uh, technology or to let it become a partner in, in disrupting itself and seeing what, what you what comes out on the other end? I can't see Kelsey or Bill, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on on this notion of systems that try to form from from seeing and observing a lot of a lot of work, trying to kind of form an understanding of them, and then then creating an output that synthesizes that. Well, I was going to just mention briefly um, half tones. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, so, um, so here's a, actually, this is, uh, Sam Houston, <laughs> but, uh, but with the halftone, you know, um, it's a way of showing value with just, uh, dots. Um, and this was created because when you, uh, with screen printing or any kind of printing, you need to, you have to have one or the other, you can't have value like, you know, gradations. So this is a way, um, a system that was created so that um, photographs could be, you know, uh, printed. Um, and uh, so, it, I mean, this is a very simple system where basically the, the size of the dots, you know, you change them uh, and they're actually prints, really old uh, etchings and things where artists would use these strategies where they would just change the weight, the weight of the line to create different kinds of values. Um, this is, uh, these are Bende dots. Uh, and basically, depending on the, the density of the dots or the, the separation of the dots, can create different values. So it's a, I mean, here's a system um, that you know someone could use. It's a very simple system, but just depending on how it gets used, could could be you know who knows what you could do with it. I mean, again, this was created for um, for rep reproducing photographs, but as this is as an example. Here's Roy Lichtenstein. He used, I mean, he basically was taking the technology and blowing, you know, making it in, you know, using cartoons and comics, but then the Bende, the dots became a signature of his work. Um, but it's basically a technology that he was, he was um, emphasizing. Um, so, it, you know, uh, but he just, he accentuated it and took it 
outside of its context and made it, you know, in some of his work, the, the dots are really big. Um, and uh, so anyhow, that's just an example of taking a system and using it in different ways to create stuff. So a system that's, as you're pointing out, inherently parametric already. And, and then it comes right back to what Kelsey was showing with the dithering, right? It's, these are, these are the same language and that it's so highly computational. If you think of taking a starting point and iterating through the pixels or iterating through in some way and making those alterations, changing the dot size, what's your input parameter and what's your output. Um, yeah, it, it seems built, maybe we can talk about the starting imagery in some of these cases, like in Lichtenstein's, I mean, you mentioned it's, it's coming from pop culture. It's taking something that was from kind of pulp, you know, of no value, ostensibly printed material huh. and then elevating it. Right. And that, you know, if we get back to the earlier piece of the cow, it's, it's, it's also kind of using the system in a way um, to, to put forward an image that otherwise might not have any value. And I think there's some power in that, right? And, and important, if someone says, I, I'm interested in this idea of screens and pixels and such, the, the starting image is really a rich area, right? We can't, we can't underestimate the, the work that goes into, or not the work, but the, the, the resultant power from, from where you're starting from and how you think about gathering your starting point of imagery. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be, you know, archival stuff, you know, maybe that, again, that, that gets to the subject, you know, like, what is the, yeah. what is the subject? I mean, I think we've been talking a lot about sort of gen, image generation through, but if you maybe dig into, you know, do work, archival kind of work and work from that, you know, so there could be, and that could be also ga gathering data, I suppose, you know, from archival materials and then putting them together in an interesting way or, um you know, I think, I mean, I think, I mean, isn't a lot of, didn't a lot of computational stuff come out of library science? Am, am I, do I recall that there was the Dewey Decimal System? Wasn't there something tied into computers or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, the needs anyhow. of dealing with vast quantities of data certainly aligns between those two, right? Right. right, in, right, in, right. When you're cataloging and codifying right. and creating taxonomies, right. you know, they're, the benefits right. of being able to deal with that computationally are, are clear cut. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But that could be another thing for folks to think about is not just generating really beautiful random stuff, but like, is there some some content there? Where are they coming? Are they making comments? Or is it is it political? Is it satirical? Is it social political? You know, these kinds of things might be something for them to consider, so. Mm. Or right. even like, more maybe. Bill, would you say it's like, right, that the Lichtenstein work is in itself about the dithering or about the bende dots rather yeah i mean he that he be that it's like people who say oh is that artist who does all the dots so right. it's like it, it he, he got that's how a lot of people know his work because they they can't maybe don't remember his name but they think oh there's this guy who does comics and then dots and stuff but but he took right. that he took that technology and just because he he would he he had studied he had done a lot of um technical drawing and, um, you know, he had, he actually used a lot of rulers and like his early work is very technical. It looks like technical drawings and stuff. Um, mm. cause he would use technical tools. Um, but then he took that and kept, and then he saw that what you saw in comics and then he, but the narrative in the comics became very important to his work. So, um, you know, taking like Augustus was saying like pulp images of, of, uh, you know, people talking on the phone or, you know, and there was text too. So, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, he, uh, I mean, and Warhol did that too. I mean, he, you know, his, everybody thinks none of his works are paintings. They're all screen printed They're, but he was using the technology uh, to make his work. And he actually worked with a lot of like the, you know, the messiness of it and, and the, the glitchiness of it. He didn't try to make perfect prints, you know, right. you look at it, yeah. it's all very, it's very blown out. I mean, in fact, he, when he was get, initially starting as a, a illustrator, young illustrator, he developed a technique where he would blot his drawings. He would use a lot of ink and then he would take paper and blot it and peel it away. So he would get all this like scattered ink. So he, he, he had a built in system to make his drawings look more interesting than just, just drawn, you know? So again, there's another way of 
altering the work through some process to, to make it better, make it different. I mean, he, he had a signature look because he developed the style of blotting. Um, so I think this could, you know, with, with the computer, with any kind of, uh, you could alter things in a way that could maybe come out. And we've already talked about that, but I think, again, that's a very interesting thing to, to explore. Yeah, when I saw the uh, Brillo pads installed for the first time, um, I think you get a sense that it's all handmade, even though his work is always contextualized as like, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to like mimic industrially produced packaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. right. Hand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I can show, I've got something up on my screen that, that, I mean, this is coming back to the pixels and dots, but it's a Chuck Close piece wow. and it, it, you know, it is pixels and dots, but the dots have more character here, right? And maybe there's more of a tension between when do we resolve the subject matter? When do we resolve the image? So I see it as kind of an extension from the, the dot screens to kind of more, um, Kind of more liberal uses of color, um, but certainly mm -hmm. easily to think of the, about this parametrically. Um, and of course, this being kind of in the vein of portraiture when we're talking about subject matter and whether that's portraiture for social justice, portraiture of someone we know, self-portraiture, that the, the orientation of the image and the alignment, of course, all of this is, is, was really critical prior to any kind of process being run on it, but I think it's an interesting counterpoint to, to the dots. And then I've got another piece here that is from uh, Golan Levin, and it's a kind of flocking diagram. So it or flocking method. It it takes in a picture just like uh, any kind of screening process would, but it builds a representation of it through lines that are algorithmically passing through areas of light and shadow or certain features, and it builds this whole other kind of notion of, of how we begin to unpack the image and understand this as a portrait and who the person is and some tension between the representation of the features and the, the methodology. So I, I see all of these as a kind of continuum of if we're starting with a certain image ways that we can build computational mm -hmm. viewpoints into it. Yeah, right. And maybe to, to some of our earlier comments about choosing, selecting, and iterating that, for instance, this process takes some time to happen. It's not, it's not a binary, it exists or doesn't exist, but it exists in a continuum of drawing um, and that there, there are opportunities in that um, to kind of Kelsey's earlier point of like walk away for hours or not, or come back in 30 seconds and seeing what the differences are that will arise if we make systems that, that compute images this way. Another piece that I wanted to show, um, thinking of, of data, and I, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure how I feel about this piece, but this is a Refik um, Anadol piece. And it's, it's thinking of pixels, though, in his case, more three-dimensionally, which is, which is tremendously complicated. But the, I think the point is that the pixels and the data is gathered from biometric information, and it, it is very liberally taking, um, ostensibly these are memories, these are like uh, EEG readings, data from someone who's thinking about a certain thing and then contorting it quite significantly so it becomes a formal representation where, you know, I don't think looking at this, I, I would at all think that it is about memory, but it's actually a piece that moves and changes and it it's a kind of a, an intriguing notion of, of really dynamically changing and filtering and altering the content to where we might not be able to connect back to what the starting point was and that that isn't always a bad thing that there's some opportunity in letting the systems run and making something that pushes it so far that it it becomes something quite experimental and discovers new form why did you say you, you weren't sure about how you felt oh more on a technical level i'm 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 I guess uh, I'm skeptical of, 
Whereas for me personally, as, as a practitioner, where is the tension of wanting some control over the process? And, and when, when reading this, I, or, or kind of reading the background of the technology, it felt like it, it had gone through so much filtration that I'm skeptical mm-hmm. of the amount of control and that uh, maybe that's more of a, of a personal kind of bias on my end. Um, whereas in my work, I'm, I'm more comfortable being able to connect the dots and being able to kind of chart it and understand it. And, and this is, right. is going to more. Yeah, I was asking because for me, I feel like I always need some sort of reference point. So if it gets manipulated past a point of comprehension or past a point of some sort of uh, recognition in relation to something else, it's hard for me to make meaning from it. I think that's a great way to phrase it, Kelsey, as a reference point, right? Because that it it does so much work for us when we're able to kind of help use that to to kind of bridge some understanding in the work. Absolutely. That's why I like the Blade Runner work so much because Blade Runner is such like a cultural icon, um, right? And so many of us also have strange memories of the movie that don't quite match up to the movie itself. And so could finding shared experience be a starting point for content? I mean, I think that's what you're saying, right? Is looking for where either social content or imagery or experiences or the content from the world around us that we're familiar with and then being able to show a new way of looking at that can be very powerful and speak to an audience. Totally. I think, yeah, I think that's right. I've been thinking lately about how with COVID-19, um, just like data collection and data visualization has become more mainstream. Um, and I'm wondering if Nina has anything to say about how that has informed your practice and if that is a reference point for you in teaching the work. Yeah, I think that any sort of starting with, you know, a particular goal for a data visualization and right, like something like COVID-19 obviously is a good example because we've been inundated with images around that. And maybe it's a another reason why it's a good example is um, so many different ways people have visualized basically the same exact data. Um, um, whether, you know, it could be data from different countries, whatever, or, or at different scales, but ultimately we're all interested in the same thing, like how many cases, how many, whatever. And there's so many different ways of visualizing that there was actually, I think, a recent visualization that was in the New York Times that got spoken about a lot because it, it was like this um, kind of circular visualization kind of to see like now that a year has passed, how are things going? But it also accidentally looked like a tapeworm uh, just because of the coloring that was chosen. So there was lots of like kind of commotion around this particular visualization. But one of the things that came about with that discussion was that's not a very traditional way of analyzing time series data, right? Whenever we have time series data, a very traditional way is you have a time X axis and then you put the counts or whatever on the Y axis and you draw lines and the the trajectory and the lines is what the eye should go to. But this was trying to capture that with, well, we have gone through a year and now we're going through another year and looking at it as like a circular thing. And I think a lot of folks who do um, like, think about there are right and wrong ways to visualize particular types of data really objected to that. And there was a lot of, you know, conversation around maybe we don't have to be so um, kind of strict about what we think is a good data visualization and allow people to explore different ways they can be, you know, visualizing the same data. And, and at some point it does, you know, start to look not like a traditional data visualization where you can start thinking about what if now I take the context of like the data out? What if my goal is no longer to communicate the rise in case numbers, but it is just to draw a picture where um, maybe you do need to kind of read the fine print to really understand what it is. I think another thing that comes to mind is um, there's two schools of thought, I feel like, with data visualization. One is that the visualization should convey the goal, like it's 
purpose quickly. Like it should, you shouldn't have to search for the meaning. It should be obvious. But then another one is maybe you should have to take it in for a while, like stare at it for a while to get. And I think they're both valid. Um, maybe the latter is not what you put on a like a newspaper every day because you're really just trying to get the message across quickly. But I think more and more so I've been seeing a lot more visualizations where you really need to like sit down with a cup of coffee and think about it for a while to get all the nuances. And um, to me, that feels more like staring at an art piece to think like, am I getting what I was supposed to get out of? Is there fine print I can read that should tell me what I should be getting out of it? Um, and yeah, so I think like there are, there are kind of starting off point can be something like that and then you move on from it until almost you obscure that starting point maybe or maybe not i don't know i i often think about obscuring that but maybe that's also not a requirement at all do you feel like students have responded to to that type of thinking yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that um, so this I was teaching like this course last semester. It's called an advanced data visualization course and lots of students who are stat students who really came in with like, we know a little bit how to visualize data and we spent so many weeks in it making better data visualizations, like actually talking about some of the rules and stuff. And then we spent a few weeks towards the end and more like trying to get creative with it. And as I said, I guess in my like little blurb about myself, it was mostly to justify for myself spending some time on it because it's sometimes hard to make time for things like this. Um, but then when I looked at the final projects that students have created, so many of them had actually bits and pieces of this like creative coding, cre like creating kind of artifacts that are not just data visualizations, but something else as part of their projects that I think they were clearly looking for an outlet for doing that. So a final mm -hmm. project that said, you don't have to visualize data if you don't want to, ended up being this thing. And, um, and um, you know, for the, these projects, they were working in teams. Um, and I think that helped with um, a few things. One of them is I think pushing the creativity. And then the other one is that technical kind of, um, difficulty that I was talking about where maybe like you have an idea and you just feel like if I can get my computer to draw this curve for me, I kind of know what I want this image to look like, but it's not always easy to get your computer to do what you want it to do. So just like working with others, I think allow them to really push their boundaries on what they could genuinely just using this one, mostly using a single R package um, create that looked nothing like any of the defaults of that package. I have a, I have a technical question, Mina, if, or maybe a, a prompt is if someone is coming from working in R and I, I've spent all of maybe an hour and a half in my life working in R. So I, I, I know very little, but if they're used to looking at work on screen, and this comes back to Bill's earlier point, is it is it relatively easy for them to upscale that work in their in their code and think about okay, it's not 600 pixels. That that's how I'm previewing it. That's the idea. But thinking about how this exists in a larger world, is it is it fairly easy for them to then write it out into something that's much more substantial and that could celebrate some of the details? So. Technically, it is easy. Um, however, I, I mean, it is easy in the sense that, yes, there are certainly functions that they can use to kind of not just make a bigger image, but make that bigger image in a way that it will actually print nicely and stuff like that. Do people often think about that to begin with? No. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't even need to be printed, to be honest, for that to be obvious. Like I've seen so many times, and I have made this mistake myself as well. You're working on a small screen and you like create something and then you put it in your presentation and then the next day you see it like on the projector screen in the classroom. <laughs> and I'm like, that is not uh, at all what I intended to show here. Uh, like I wasn't thinking about where that's going next. Um, so that is something we do actually um, kind of try to teach students as well, because it actually becomes relevant in scientific publishing too. just like 
people might print your paper, you know, it should still look nice. It should, even if it's you know, like black and white, it should look good at different sizes. It should look good is something we do talk about, but it's certainly not the first thing um, I think people think about. Um, probably two reasons. One is that they're rarely seeing anything that is not on screen. Uh, that it doesn't become like a part of the thought process. If you're, if a lot of what you do is analyze data and visualize data. Um, and then number two is, I think there's the, the, there's one part of it, which is, can you get your computer to generate an image that would scale well and still look like the way you intended to look like? Um, and then number two is like, what is a printer you can use to get it to print that. Like I'm thinking about some of those images, like generative mm -hmm. art images people make where it just almost looks like all these lines look like there's fur on screen, right? But they're just like individual, so many lines. What printer prints something like that? I don't know, but I'm gonna guess not the one in our hallway here in the office. <laughs> And That's so actually, access to that and understanding how those things physically work is certainly not the part of the education that like we provide to students. So I'm not sure where they might be getting that. Yeah, the, that that was something we talk about on, over here at Smith Warehouse about the printout component. Um, do, we, we, we were hoping the university will invest because I think it would be great at computer science to have really good printers and I think that would encourage output, you know, I think, like you say, I think if, if you, you knew that you could print output something really fabulous, you would have okay. students probably exploring that more. I think it would be great, but we're not there. But maybe that's something we can, for the new curriculum, we can. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Fantastic. Well, I think we're we're closing in on the end of our talk. This has been really fun and illuminating. And I think we've covered a lot of important territory and started to unpack a lot of the issues that surround a competition like this or ways that students and participants might begin to enter it. So I want to thank the three of you for, for generously giving this, this time for this talk. I think it's been, again, really, really lovely. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Great. So thank you all for attending. And again, next week, same time, same place on this channel, there will be a um, more, more technical um, demonstration of some techniques using uh, neural networks for the competition. So have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Great. Bye. Bye. Bye.